So sisters, the, the uh, title of tonight's lesson is Upside Down or Right Side Up. You get to choose. So I'm excited about today because we're going to talk about what it means to be upside down versus right side up. And we're going to give some great practicals on how to choose, you guessed it, right side up. So guess what, ladies? God sent the coronavirus. He has sent this pandemic to get our attention. The world is self-quarantining. The stock market is crashing. Schools are closed. Tourism travel have come to, an, to a halt. The authorities have forced restaurants to pretty much close down or have in, in um, outtake only. Social distancing is a real thing. Toilet paper has become the most valuable commodity. We surely do live in a strange age. Life has gone from facing and dealing, dealing with trials as we know them to having a panic attack when you're going on a trip to the grocery store. It is crazy. I've been feeling weary, overwhelmed, and exhausted. I've been anxious and stressed, and I know I said this on Sunday, I have been trying to manage my thinking, but the battle is real. Um, you know, I know this because my hair's falling out. God loves me so much. He always gives me a great indication of when I'm stressed. Um, I've been uh, afraid, insecure, unstable, very on edge, as my family can attest. And yes, I have apologized to them. I've been impatient, short-tempered, easily irritated, in not a good place. I've been feeling out of control. How about you? I'm so grateful for uh, so many things at this time as well, but especially for my dear sisters, and one of them in particular, Christina Mejia, she helped me to connect with some of these feelings by sending me this very funny meme. And it read, pray for the huggers. We are not okay. Do you know how hot it is not to hug when you're a hugger at heart? The struggle is real. <laughs> I was like, that's me! I am struggling! So thank you, Christina. And I know there are many other huggers out there. It's everything we've taught, most of us, from very young. So, sisters, this is a real, real pandemic on, on a spiritual level, even more so than physically, for us who want to know God and who walk with God. You know, I, I feel like I've been thrown out into the deep blue ocean and I'm treading water. Have you ever felt that? Now, that's one thing to be in a pool treading water because you choose, okay? And by the way, that's a very good way to burn calories. However, when you feel like there's no land in sight and it's very deep, that's a whole different story. Um, you know, I wish I could say I was completely at peace, but I am working towards it, I have not yet arrived. Um, you know, it's been hard to renew my mind lately, to focus on meditating. However, I am in the process of realizing and understanding, being honest about what I'm feeling, thereby exposing what I'm thinking. Because we know, sisters, as we think, so we feel, and then we choose and we create words and actions. Um, embracing the pain is not easy and then reconceptualizing, renewing of the mind. And that's what we're gonna talk about today in and with some great practicals. So I am weak. And when I think about what God says about weakness, it's exactly where I need to be. So tonight's title, upside down or right side up, you get to decide. Point number one is, let me just see. Upside down equals death. Turn your Bibles, ladies, to Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19. On, this day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you, that I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live, that you may love the Lord your God, Listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, sisters, 
and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Women, this is as real to us today as it was back then. God is calling us to choose life instead of death during the COVID-19 pandemic. Life choices would include all the attributes of love and peace and forgiveness and unity that God describes in his powerful word. 1 Corinthians 13, 3 through 7, we know that these are the qualities of what love is, right? I'd like to read that in the message version. It says, I give everything I own, if I gave everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't have love, I have gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I am bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled up head, doesn't force itself on others. It's always putting others before itself. Love doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth. Love puts up with anything. Love trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but, but keeps going to the end. And we know the NIV finishes in verse 8a, the first part, love never fails. This is choosing life, guys. When we put others above ourselves, when we choose not to get irritated and annoyed and prideful and arrogant and self-centered, Galatians 5, through 26 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. It talks about walking in step with the Spirit. And we know that the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. These are all life choices. Life choices. Colossians 3, 13 through 15 the Bible says, bear with each other and forgive one another. Let's be honest, women. Sometimes the best we can do is bear with somebody who lives with us, a roommate, a coworker, a family member, a spouse, a child, a mother, a father, right? But the Bible says, bear with each other and forgive as the Lord forgives you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. And in verse 15, it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And I love the last few, four words, three words, and be thankful. Gratitude, the choice to be grateful, the mindset of gratitude is a life choice. Forgiveness, unity, thankfulness. We also know in Philippians 4, 4 through 5. Can you look? Are you blown away by how many life choices we have in the Bible? Philippians 4 says, rejoice in the Lord always. That's another life choice. Paul says, I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Then the promise is that the Lord is near. In verse 8, it says, finally, sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is praiseworthy, think about such things. Life choices. <laughs> Romans 12 talks about do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Another life choice to figure out what renewing of the mind is and actually practice it. 2 Corinthians 10, verse three through five. And I hope you're taking notes, sisters, so that you can go back and really read through this. I'll also post this lesson on our website. But in 2 Corinthians 10, verse three through five, it says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Right now, sisters, the world is waging the war of fear and anxiety and stress and greed and hysteria, pandemonia. 
right? But those are not the weapons the Bible gives us. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. Right. On the contrary, they have divine power. And the battle we're fighting, sisters, is a spiritual battle. We need God's divine power to do what? To demolish those strongholds. Stronghold is a mentality that has you gripped. And it's not a life choice mentality. It's a death choice mentality. And we're going to talk about what those are. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. The good we ought to do, James 4, 17, the Bible says, if you don't do the good you ought to do, that's a sin. So choosing the good we ought to do is another life choice. Now let's transition to the death zone, which we never want to camp out in. But the death choices are the sin that God clarifies very clearly in his word. And this world has got, done a great job, unfortunately, of putting most of that sin in the gray zone, the twilight zone, where we we don't take ownership of it because we don't have a conviction that it is actually a sin. Galatians 5, 19 through 21 talks about those sins. And it talks about sexual immorality. That was me before I became a Christian. Impurity. That was my drug of choice, unfortunately. Debauchery. That is overindulging in whatever. I overindulged in exercise. I overindulged in food. I over, I've overindulged in Netflix. That's debauchery. Underindulging, too. If we don't eat enough to sustain our bodies, that's a sin, too. Idolatry. I idolized my boyfriend before I was a disciple. Witchcraft. That's not just the wizards and the witches and curses. That's also astrology. That's also numerology. That's also caring what your zodiac sign says and what's written in the paper for that day. Sisters, that is a sin. Hatred. Not just, I'm going to throw this at you and kill you, but any kind of non-lack of love, any kind of lack of love in your heart towards somebody is a form of hatred. I have been so guilty of that as a Christian. Discord is division. Jealousy, envy, wanting somebody that's something that somebody else has or not wanting somebody to have something that they get, right? I have been there. Fits of rage. Again, you don't have to be throwing plates across the room to be guilty of having a fit of rage. How about road rage? How about the words that come out of your mouth or the signals you make with your hands or the rolling of the eyes, the haughty eyes? That was my one on the road for a long time until I got a conviction that it was wrong. Selfish ambition, just caring about self, the number one. Dissensions, factions, all of this has to do with division. Gossiping, slandering, discrimination of any type. It is wicked sin in God's eyes, and it is a death choice. Envy, drunkenness, orgies. We know that orgies go beyond having sex with more than one person. You can be involved in an orgy of sin. The Bible says, sisters, in verse 21, that God is warning us, as he did before, that those who live like this, make these choices, will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's a death choice, all of those. Philippians 4, 6 talks about do not be anxious about anything. Anxiety, not getting anxious or feeling anxious, but remaining anxious for a prolonged period of time. This is a sin. The Bible says by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, instead we are to present our request to God in order to overcome anxiety. So point number one, upside down, Death decision. So we've described the difference between life decisions and death decisions. These are real and valid feelings. All of them are. They're real because you are feeling them. And like I've shared with you, I have felt them in a real way my entire life. But this week has been especially turbulent. 
We must get in touch with and be honest about these feelings, women. Thoughts and feelings are energy. If stored in the subconscious memory without processing them in a healthy, godly way, they will literally poison our mind and our bodies. They will be deposited as death in our brains. However, on the life side, if we choose to take the incoming information through our five senses into our conscious mind, with the upcoming information triggering memories that come from our subconscious mind, and we choose to be honest about what we're feeling, and then line them up with God's word, take captive those that are not godly, make them ob obedient by replacing them with what is true, with what is noble, with what is beautiful. Philippians 4, 8. This process is true renewal of the mind. Let's go to Proverbs 2, verse 10. I love this scripture. I love Proverbs. For wisdom will enter your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Well, sisters, the hub of our emotion is our heart. The hub of information, of knowledge, is our mind, which is very closely linked to the soul. So God is appealing to us here to put wisdom into our heart by putting knowledge into our mind. Is that what you're doing, even in this current circumstance? Getting the right wisdom and the right knowledge? Or are you glued to your screen and watching every single broadcast, regardless of the validity of it, about this pandemic and getting sucked into the death choices that most of the world are making at this time? Yes, you need to be up to date with the current events, okay? Use valid resources like the World Health Organization, like the CDC. Take heed to the directives and the instructions. Women, don't become self-righteous and stupid when you're not heeding correction. Proverbs 12.1 says, she who doesn't heed correction is stupid, okay? So don't think you're super spiritual and can hug on everyone and meet with everyone at this time. We are to take heed to these guidelines and we are to be obedient and submissive to the authorities as Romans 13 teaches us. But we need to put our energy into seeing what God, who created the coronavirus, he has to say about our thinking, feeling, and choosing. We must understanding what is, understand what is happening to us mentally and emotionally in order to find that peace that transcends all understanding. Until we understand it, we'll never have the right knowledge to process it and deliver a healthy, godly, building up attitude for ourselves and for those around us. In a sense, we're all going through a period of grieving. You know, the definition of grief is the end of a familiar pattern or behavior, right? Grief doesn't only happen when we lose somebody to death. Think about how many familiar patterns and behaviors have changed in the last two weeks or less. Think about the freedoms that we have lost. You know, as Americans, we like freedom. There's a reason the Statue of Liberty is so valuable, right? As we've always had so many wonderful freedoms, we've also become very entitled. And I know for me, that's what's being exposed, is really it's perceived control because what I'm feeling is out of control, right? Because suddenly I can't hug whoever, I can't go wherever when I want to. And there's a feeling of out of control. And I realize too that I've tried to control those in my household as I've lost control with other things. That is a sin and I have apologized, okay? But do you see how if we don't process this, we can't own it and we can't, we can't change it? So when this, these freedoms, this structure that we lived in for so long gets disrupted, especially suddenly and drastically, which has happened, much of our foundation of who we are and what brings us stability and a sense of belonging gets shaken. That's what's happening. 
Freedom to meet at work, marry, bury our loved ones, play group sports, freedom to take vacations and travel, attend class at school, have play dates with your kids, go to the mall, go to the movies, eat at restaurants, go to the grocery store and feel safe, see full shelves, hug, kiss those we love, freedom to be in control of our schedules as we knew them. These are a lot of changes that have happened to us very suddenly. We must take time to process what is happening. Then we can move through it in a beneficial and healthy way. So, are you with me? Let's talk about some practicals. Um, well, first I wanna talk about some biblical figures who actually were quarantined. This is amazing, I've never thought about it in this light, but think about poor Noah and his family. They were quarantined on the ark for at least one whole year. Can you imagine? Think about the biblical characters like Rahab. Think about the Israelites in Egypt when they were quarantined to their houses during the plagues. And when the angel of death passed by their doorway, they were told to stay inside. I love Isaiah 26 in verse 20. The Bible says, go my people. Enter your rooms and shut the doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until God's wrath has passed by. Verse 21. See, the Lord is coming out of his dwelling to punish the people of the earth for their sins. The earth will disclose the blood shed on it. The earth will conceal its slain no longer. God tell, told them in Isaiah to go into their houses and quarantine themselves. God is working. What about a New Testament example of Paul, who we know was on house arrest? And instead of feeling sorry for himself and, and landing and, and hanging out in the death zone, instead, he chose life and he produced Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, the book of Hebrews, a sum of what we know he wrote while he was in chains. You know, one of my favorite examples of having his whole world turned upside down several times during several quarantines was Joseph. Go with me to Acts chapter 7. I love that the New Testament reiterates and summarizes the story from Genesis. It says in verse 9, because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph. Okay, that would be a struggle right there. When somebody's jealous of you and then they throw you into a pit, quarantine you in a very scary small area, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. Can you imagine the fear, the anxiety, the stress, the, 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 the insecurity that Joseph must have experienced during this time? But God was with him and rescued him from all his trouble, troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And we know that when he got to Egypt, he was sold as a slave to Potiphar. And then he made lemonade out of lemons, women, and he became chief in Potiphar's household over all of Potiphar's affairs. And when Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him, he loved God so much by himself with nobody holding him accountable. He walked so closely with God that he said to this no doubt beautiful, attractive woman, far be it from me to sin against my God and Potiphar by sleeping with you. And you would have thought that it would have come, become easier for him from that point. Oh no, you know the story. She falsely accuses him and cries rape, and he gets convicted, imprisoned, without knowing for how long or what would happen to him. That was some serious quarantining, right? And then we see in verse 11, a famine struck all of Egypt and Canaan, bringing great suffering, and our ancestors could not find food, okay? When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, Thanks to Joseph's faithfulness. And we know the story about the cupbearer and the baker and how the cupbearer eventually did tell Pharaoh about Joseph. And then he was brought before Pharaoh as somebody who was sold as a slave into Egypt. 
Years later, now before Pharaoh, trusting God the whole way, choosing life over death, one decision at a time, and he was able to tap into the wisdom of God and tell Pharaoh what his dreams meant and come up with the best plan ever to save not only Egypt, but the world from a famine that would have wiped out next to everybody. So just like God used Joseph to save the Israelites physically, we know too, of course, that Jesus was used to save us mentally, emotionally, spiritually from the invisible virus, sin, the death choice. And write down Matthew 26, 30, 36 through 39. That is when Jesus goes to Gethsemane. And that is just such a powerful demonstration of what we need to do in not only being honest, which is the first practical challenge that I want to give you, you women. Be honest about your feelings, okay? Is this going to be a mindset choice change for you tonight? Will you choose life over the death that you've been choosing? So some practical challenges is number one, be 100% honest about how you feel. The bad, the ugly, the terrible. Always go to God first with these feelings, right? Just like Jesus did in Gethsemane. We know that the greatest commandment God desires from us is to love him first to be in that love relationship with him where we trust him, where we give him our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. So on that note, don't be calling any sisters, including me, when you're having a meltdown before going to Jesus. He is our 911, okay? In order to be honest, I found that journaling is a great practical tool to help me get in touch with my feelings. A lot of the time I just feel overwhelmed, but I cannot identify why or where it's coming from or the source, right? So a great practical technique to get in touch is to figure out what are the five basic feelings? Well, I'm going to tell you. Mad, sad, glad, afraid, and embarrassed. Mad, sad, glad, they rhyme, they're easy. Afraid, sadly, this one is very common to us, especially women. I've battled with it for many years and uh, continue to overcome one thought at a time, but the struggle is real. And embarrassed. Embarrassed. I felt embarrassed so many times. It is not a good feeling, right? What I've realized is I've got to stop trying to be perfect all the time and disciple myself versus being humble with God and honest and then laying that same journal in front of one of my or two of my trusted disciple friends who can read my heart and help me really process these things to get to a different place. What ends up happening a lot of the times, women, and this is amongst Christian women, is when somebody inquires, how are you, Sarah? Our response is, fine, right? You know the fine? Because we don't want to look weak or look bad. I can identify, right? But what's really happening is you're creating a state of disequilibrium between your mind and your gut because you're anxious and overwhelmed and stressed and everything else in the book on the death side, but you're saying you're fine. So your mind is telling your gut you're lying, which you are. So sisters, this is a call to repent of lying. Be honest. Otherwise, you'll be speaking devil like the Bible tells us in John 8 verse 44. And Jesus doesn't appreciate or approve of devil, right? The second practical challenge to choose life versus death is embrace and accept the pain. This is the part, sisters, when we go with Jesus into Gethsemane and where we cry and we sweat and we scream and we holler and we journal and we get it all out. Jesus, Jesus knew what he was facing when he went to Gethsemane. He chose to embrace the pain and go through it, right? He only asked his disciples for moral support. 
He only asked them to help him carry his burden, Galatians 6, 1 through 5. There's a very big difference between burden and load. Burden is these feelings that are real and valid that we need help with to process and to share, right? He did not ask them to hang on that cross for him. He did not go out and binge on Facebook or Netflix or Instagram. He did not take alcohol or other drugs, even prescription drugs, to numb out and not feel. He did not complain to God or refuse to accept the race that God had marked out for him. Though in doing so and and having a pure heart, he was completely 100% honest. Are you honest? Jesus is our role model in everything. Go to Gethsemane with him. Point number two, right side up, choose life. So we talked about upside down, death choices. And then I gave you those two practicals of being completely honest. And number two, going to Gethsemane with Jesus. Now, right side up, choose life. What a great example we have of a very faithful man who was not even an Israelite in the New Testament. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 8, verse 8. The Bible reads, The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. And he said to those following him, truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very moment. Jesus still heals virally. He doesn't have to show up in person to help you, to rescue you, to heal you, to redeem you. Jesus works invisibly. We see the reward of Joseph's life choices. God used him to save the world physically. We see the reward of Jesus' life choices. God used him to save the world from the invisible virus called sin. Some practical challenges to choose right side up and walk in the light. Choosing life. Number one, imitate the centurion's faith and courage. Believe that God has sent this plague, this COVID-19 is from God to purify the church, to instill fear in the church, guys. God is real and he could drop every one of us dead right now. Are you hanging out in God's church, but you have secret sin? I'm so grateful for the leadership of the international Christian churches. Thank you for calling us as a movement to fast and pray and confess yesterday. This was so refreshing to my soul. And I'm so proud of the Orlando Church family who took this challenge and charge seriously. Guys, if we don't choose to walk in the light and stay open, it is nobody, nobody, nobody's fault but ours if we end up in hell. So, Believe that God has sent this plague to purify you. And then for us to reach the non-Christians that are fearful right now because they don't have a solid foundation of Jesus and the truth to stand on. And their treading water is pretty much almost drowning right now. You know, Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very moment. Choosing to believe or choosing to doubt is just that, a simple decision. Choose life. Number two, 
in order to make something your belief, you must actually practice it. James 1, 22. Recite this with me. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. What a simple, basic truth. And yet there's still some of us out there, including myself at times, who choose not to do what it says. This is a problem, right? Now, thank God for grace, and we are saved by grace. And thank God that these hard, real death feelings that we think and feel, initially, we haven't sinned yet. We only sin when we choose to engage in this type of perpetual, continual thought and feeling pattern over a period of time, right? Not just once or twice do you do what it says because you're bored, because you're overstimulated, because you're constantly binging on the screen. No, number three is practice intentional breathing. Learn to calm yourself down. This is so powerful, guys. God gives us the ability by simply paying attention and doing deliberate and intentional breathing. Learn how to use it and do it. Right? I want to I want to have us right now do a little breathing exercise. Okay? So wherever you're at, I want you to put your hands on your lap, close your eyes, and we're going to practice the box breathing method. So what we're going to do is for four counts, we're going to inhale. For four counts, we're going to hold our breath. For four counts, we're going to exhale. And then for four counts, we're going to hold our breath. Do you get the box? Okay, so let's do that together a couple of times. Inhale. One, two, three, four. Hold your breath. Two, three, four. Exhale. Two, three, four. Hold your breath. Two, three, four. Again, inhale. Two, three, four. Hold your breath. Two, three, four. Exhale. Two, three, four. Hold your breath. Two, three, four. Imagine if you took time to do this periodically through the day. Physiologically, what happens is this brings your heart rate down. You can be in a moment of extreme stress and anxiety and fear, and you can stop, drop, and breathe, and you can change. Number four, practical challenge, is practice by meditation. Practice practicing God's way of choosing life by meditation. This is another thing that's so misunderstood by so many. And today, who are popular meditators? Sadly, the yogis, the Muslims, the Hindus, not the disciples of Jesus. God says to meditate day and night in Joshua 1, 7 and 8 on his word. I want us to practice a little meditation together to give you an example. Now, a quick differential differentiating between Eastern meditation and biblical meditation. Eastern meditation is rid your mind of everything, think about nothing. This is a very dangerous state because you are susceptible to demonic influence, okay? The word namaste means the God in me salutes the God in you. This is idolatry, sisters. We should not participate in Eastern meditation. Biblical meditation, however, is all about calming your mind, stilling your mind, and filling it with the truth of God's word, God's promises, God's directives. Do you see the difference? Death and life. But if you're not knowledgeable and wise about the difference, you can be thinking you're doing a great thing when you're not. Okay? So an example of meditation would be to recite a certain scripture over and over in your head. For me, many scriptures have, have, I've done this with many scriptures. The Bible talks about writing them on your heart, right? Imagine reciting uh, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Imagine reciting that a thousand times. You could do that if you chose to. What I've done is pretty much that. And then after that practice, 
I've chosen for another thousand times or so to make that scripture personal. So we know for Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Then I can say, Sonia can be patient always through Christ who gives her strength. And imagine if I recited that over and over and over, sedimenting, anchoring, filtering, recycling, washing that, that round and round in your head to clarify, to solidify, to, to, to um, anchor those things into my heart and therefore into my speech and my actions. That's how that happens. Not just because you look at a sticky note once a week or check your verse of the day. So what I want us to practice along with this idea of meditation, just a quick do it with me, we're not going to do the thousand times thing because, as you know, <laughs> we've been here for a long time. What we are going to practice, though, is something I've shared with the Orlando sisters before and that has helped me tremendously in my walk. And that is to connect my breathing with acknowledging and proclaiming the name of God. Okay, so how do we do this? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17 says, pray continually. God's directive and hope and wish for us is not to pray once a day. It is to have a continual dialogue with God. That seems overwhelming. I know it did for me for a long time until I understood this connection with our breath and proclaiming the name of God. Nobody is overwhelmed by the thought of breathe all day, right? So God wants us to incorporate into our breathing, remembering him. And what I've done is taken the word Yahweh, which is how God was known in the Old Testament. And think about inhaling and saying, yeah. On the exhale, proclaiming the way. Yeah. Close your eyes again. Put your hands next to your side and do this with me a few times. Deep inhale. Yeah. Exhale. Imagine, sisters, if you train your mind in joyful times, in anxious times, in fun times, in hard times, to stop and intentionally think about your breathing. And as you're thinking about the breathing, maybe you do the box breath a few times to calm your heart rate down. And then you start proclaiming Yahweh. And as you're proclaiming the name of the living God, you are thinking about who you worship. The God who created everything we see and everything we don't see, who knit you together fearfully and wonderfully in your mother's womb, who made you the unique designer babe that you are, and nobody does you like you do you. Now what's bothering you? Perspective. Do you see how amazing that is? We worship an incredible God, women. But we've got to learn these tools in our toolbox, these utensils in our kitchen, right? It would be very hard to fry an egg without an egg flip, without a pan, right? God has given us access to these wonderful, free, immediately accessible, powerful tools. But we haven't taken the time, a lot of us, to know about them, understand them biblically, line it up with what the Bible says, and actually practice them consistently. You've heard the saying, right? Consistent is the best thing you can be. Do what you're supposed to do, be where you're supposed to be, and do it consistently. That is godly character, women. And I want to challenge you to implement these wonderful, powerful, powerful tools. Another practical is practicing fasting. And again, I'm so proud of our sisters. I know that many of them met in discussion groups via Zoom last night, this morning, and some will happen tonight to discuss and confess with each other the things that God has exposed in our heart. Fasting is not an if you fast. In Matthew 6, verse 16, the Bible says, when you fast, along with when you pray and when you give. 
I really want to challenge the Orlando women to become when you fast type of disciples. Chapter uh, number six, excuse me, <laughs> number six is make yourself and your family or household an adjustable schedule. I know for me, just losing the regular schedule I had has been, you know, created instability in me. So make a new one, right? Making sure you're still seeking first the kingdom in your schedule. Women, I want to appeal to you that this is our fellowship time for midweek. Whenever your Bible talk meets, that's your time with your Bible talk. Have your discipling times every week. Be available and ready to study the Bible with people. Generate more studies. I'm so proud of our, our sister, Krista Cornette. She's, along with many others, have posted up on her Facebook and social media, hey, if you want to do a virtual Bible study, I'm ready, right? We are able to reach so many more people. You know, I was so encouraged yesterday after the fast that one of our awesome sisters, Amelia, from our wonderful Chicago church, called me, and they have a friend down in Claremont, which is Orlando, who wants to study the Bible. And tomorrow at 6, Pamela and I are going to do a virtual study with her. Guys, God is moving in powerful ways, right? So we've got to have a routine to guard us against choosing laziness, choosing debauchery, choosing isolation. You can either do really well during this time, or you can really tank and fall away. The choice will be yours. Another practical would be connect with more people that you regularly don't talk to. You have more time. You're not driving anywhere. A lot of you, and, and I know that this is a real you know, issue to be praying about, have lost jobs, right? Let's make sure we don't fall into faithlessness or idle time. Use this time, guys. Believe that God can provide. I know one of our sisters was supposed to be laid off on April 20th, got her job extended through July, and now is training for a different position. I know there are companies out there like Amazon who are hiring. Like I know Pamela's company is hiring. There are companies out there. So we've got to believe as we do our due diligence to reach out, okay? Um, I'm so proud of people like Penny. Penny today has offered to make masks for our church family here in Orlando. And um, Penny is such a great servant anyway. And I know Samia and Enders have been making masks too. They're looking for the need and they're seeing how they can in a practical way meet the needs because the needs now are different than the needs were before in a certain way, right? Another practical is do some Spring cleaning. It is officially spring. <laughs> How convenient. Clean out some closets and drawers you've neglected. Get some new books. Get some tutorials. Pick up a new hobby. Write a book. So, and of course, above all, we've got to be renewing our mind through this whole process, right? So um, as we come in for a landing here, I want us to do a final exercise together. This is only going to take about 10 to 15 minutes. I asked the sisters in Orlando to have a pen and paper ready because uh, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about how to renew the mind, right? Um, it's easy to say renew the mind, but if you don't have the practicals, that could be very overwhelming in and of itself. And for a long time as a Christian, it was for me. And, and for a long time, I neglected really taking control of my emotions by taking control of my thinking. And of course, I still have to work on it diligently. But that's, that verse in uh, Romans 12, verse 2, it says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Sisters, that word renewing is current tense. That's not one and done like the half marathon I ran once. That was definitely a one and done. But renewing is something you do all day long, every day, for the rest of your life. And again, nobody's bummed out that you have to breathe all day, every day, for the rest of your life, or that your heart beats all day, every day, for the rest of your life. It's, it's understandable on a physical level, how much more should we be applying this spiritual principle to our thinking and our emotions, the non-visible, right? So the exercise is this. First of all, I want you to take your paper 
or your pad, whatever you're doing, and I want you to write down one thing that is bothering you the most. So something in the death zone, all those death choices we talked about. What are you anxious about? What are you fearful about? What person is getting under your skin and you just feel like punching them, right? That would be a confession too. Okay, so whatever is bothering you the most, write that down now. And of course, we don't have time for big, long paragraphs. And you need more time to think through this. I'm just going to give you the steps, the technique. If you apply this to thoughts in the future consistently that bother you, the death zone thinking and feeling, you will learn quicker and more in a more agile and accurate and effective way to discipline the feelings, the thinking, to create just incredible, consistent peace. You know, in Jeremiah 17, the Bible talks about the person who is blessed, superlatively happy, which is the happiness that comes from within. And the visual that God gives us is this beautiful, huge, strong tree that's, that the Bible describes as never fearing, even in a year of drought, because the tree is connected to the stream. That, my sisters, is the perfect example of mental and emotional mastery. That is a consistent picture of the peace that transcends all understanding that the Bible talks about in Philippians 4, verse 8. That should be the goal for every one of our sisters, even during that time of our month. Okay, nowhere in the Bible do I read, be patient and kind and tolerant, except when right? Not even during menopause, which I know is knocking at my door. How fun are those emotions and hot flashes? <laughs> so hopefully you've just thought about it a little bit and have written down the one thing that's bothering you the most, okay? Number two, on a scale of one to 10, how much is this bothering you? Now you might just go 15 because I'm so bothered. That's okay. Your scale can be 1 to 20. Okay? So number three. Now what we're going to do is we're going to practice what is called visualization. Visualization is basically picturing a certain event and placing yourself back there again. So what I want you to do is think about the happiest moment, and hopefully there are many happy moments in your life, but choose the first one that comes to your mind, the happiest moment of your life. And I want you to write down who was there, see the people, feel the feelings, hear the sounds, smell the smells, Feel the textures. Guys, this is such a profound power that God has given us that when we actually take time to recall to our conscious mind those happy things that have been stored as healthy, happy memories in our subconscious, what happens is the same hormones and chemicals that were ignited back 5, 10, 15 minutes, days, years ago when that event occurred. So that dopamine rush, that serotonin rush, that oxytocin, which is the love hormone rush, happens to you again simply by imagining it. You tell me that God hasn't given us access to power that I believe so few people, if anybody on this planet, has actually accessed 100%. And doesn't that make sense when we think about how scientists only understand 8 to 10% of how the brain works? We serve an amazing God, guys. So take time to write down the happiest moment of your life. And again, feel the feelings, see the faces, smell the smells, hear the music. Imagine that you're back there and reliving. Maybe it's your wedding day. Maybe it's the birth of your child. Maybe it's your graduation. Maybe it's the day you made Jesus your Lord and Savior and became a true baptized disciple. Whatever that moment for you is, take time to recall it. And I realize again that, you know, you might need more time 
than we have available right now, because I'm sure Devon and Diego are giving me the it's enough sign. <laughs> I'm almost done. So, um, so now, after allowing yourself to have that incredible chemical and hormonal rush, I ask you this question again. On a scale of one to 10, how much is your bother now bothering you? For me, as I've done these exercises, suddenly my 11 is now at maybe an eight. Isn't that amazing? Nothing has changed in the circumstances. What has changed is your perspective. Imagine if you recalled two of the happiest moments, five of the happiest moments, 25 of the happiest moments. Imagine if you added the funniest moments to that list, the most inspirational times of your life. Do you see the type of power that God wants to give us, guys? And what I was convicted of is sometimes it took me some time to even recall, well, let me think about a time I was inspired, right? That just shows how seldom I recall those files. Or I have work to do in creating more of those memories, right? The challenge is endless and the challenge is exciting. Feel challenged, be challenged, apply the challenge, embrace the challenge. This is incredibly powerful stuff, guys. So after you've written down a few more, think about again on a scale of one to 10, how much is your bother bothering you now? In my experience, it goes down again. And the final technique that I'm gonna leave you with is this question. Why is COVID-19 the best thing that could possibly be happening to you now? Write down five to 10 reasons why the COVID-19 pandemic is the best thing that could possibly be happening to you right at this moment. I was amazed when I really thought about that. God is teaching me and exposing in me things that would not have been exposed, things I would not have seen and then changed without this pandemic. God is providing opportunities for growth that I wouldn't have without this pandemic. God is calling me to a whole different level of peace with him alone being enough. And sisters, as you think through those things, now the final thing I want you to write down is on a scale of one to 10, how much is your bother bothering you now? Imagine if you took this technique of visualization and applied it to every death feeling and, and decision and feeling and, and mindset, feeling and think, you know, pattern of thought that you have from your conscious mind that comes in or that's triggered from your, conscious, from your subconscious mind. The possibilities of renewal of mind, of reconceptualizing are endless when we actually apply the truth. Because we know that in John 8, 31 and 32, the Bible said that if you hold to my teachings, women of God, you are truly my disciples. Then you will know the truth. If you apply what the scripture says, if you are honest about your feelings, if you confess your sins, and if you meditate and pray and fast and learn what it means to intentionally breathe and do the work of renewing the mind, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free and to God be the glory.